President, President Limbert's address is entitled Historians as Public Intellectuals, a Cost-Benefit Analysis Seen from the Interior.
quite a while ago, but I went to a conference. First time I had ever been to a conference. It was a, um, I was going to get an award. I was a college student, and I had never been at anything like a, like a little space like this. I had never heard a banquet speaker. So we had a speaker who was lively and interesting and charming, and just as I thought he had us all warmed up, he, that was the end of his speech, and he sat down. So I was 19 or 20, and I said to the adults at my table, I said, I must have missed something there, but I never quite got his subject. And they said, he didn't have a subject, he's an inspirational speaker. <laughs> That's pretty odd. So it was unsettling enough to know that there was such a thing as an inspirational speaker. And then, over the years, it has been even more unsettling to become one. And that is unsettling beyond imagination. So I will go, uh, the plan for the evening here is a brief round of Jeremiah, and, and you will get into a Jeremiah mode, but I shall hide behind my distinguished predecessor in this office, Kenneth Jackson, for that. I will simply um, use his remarks for that. And then I will make a quick shift to utopian visions and celebrations of possibility. And that's where we will spend most of, our, most of our time. I should say I am very happy to be among fellow American historians my organization, the Sandy American West, was founded about um, a little bit more than 25 years ago. We had an event maybe three or four years into our founding. Uh, there were people, professors from many different disciplines doing the American West there. I think a beverage or two must have been in play because as I've made some remarks about how pleasant it was to be there, for some reason, it's hard to recreate, I guess that's not hard to recreate, I referred to history as the queen of the disciplines. I spent the next five years paying for having said that and rebuilding interdisciplinary bridges and paying my respect to all the other disciplines. Uh, years dealing with the after effects of that unnecessarily honest remark. <laughs> and yet, it does seem very pleasant here to just be able to say that history, clean of the disciplines, and not to have to repair any damage done from that. There was a strong and worth considering foundation in that remark when I made it. In a university like the University of Colorado, the discipline of history is, I not only think this might be true, I know this is true, the discipline of history is distinctively positioned to lead in the enterprise of interdisciplinary collaboration. Not, not just the wording there, lead, but not dominate. And that must have been the state of the imperial notion of the queen there. So, history, and the power to convene is really the bedrock of my cheer and optimism in that part of the, the talk. Um, yes, we are a community centered on the study of the past. We are aware of our own discipline and solicitous of its well-being, but also we are, we are also aware of our distinctive capacity to be inclusive and even unifying on campuses where departments and schools compete for resources and defend their boundaries. History can reveal those boundaries between what are usually called the silos of departments and disciplines. We can reveal those boundaries as arbitrary, and then we can offer very compelling invitations to cross or transgress, or maybe best of all, to dance on those boundaries. We can go back to dancing with professors, dancing interdisciplinary with professors, which is a little bit, that's really quite a colorful image if you think about it, pretending <laughs> an interdisciplinary dance. Okay, that's some other time. Uh, so in the particularly 2015 recommendation, to get at least a unit of the cheer on record before we go to Jeremiah, let's not have a tug of war with the STEM people, with the uh, science, technology, engineering, and math people. Let's not have a tug of war. Instead, let's awaken science and engineering faculty to the tough world their students will face if those students are not given a down-to-earth orientation to the origins of the society they will enter or where their work will matter. Scientists and engineers, I'm uh, overgeneralizing, but not by much, are often well-intentioned, but they are naive and unprepared for the world. In an analogy that doesn't really go over well in those circles, and I kind of gave up using it, some science and engineering circles, but they, some of them, when they have very important findings that are of great value to the world, they go out into that world in the manner of recently shorn sheep heading into a blizzard. <laughs> well, they love that line. They just make that up. So, for instance, many years ago, uh, early in the years of the center, I attended an event with the several environmental protection associations 
uh, Association, or agency, excuse me, Environmental Protection Agency scientists who were working in Leadville, Colorado, which is a place that has a devastated landscape for mining. The EPA people, it was a super fun site, they genuinely really wanted to help. It's not clear to me that they had heard that phrase usually used in mockery, I'm from the government, I'm here to help, and then the flight that occurs right after, after that statement. So these folks, when I met them, a bunch of them in a meeting that I spent some time with, I could not fathom how these Westerners, or excuse me, how these federal agents had been unable to even have a clue about the hostility that Westerners have to officials from the federal government and have had out of a very complicated history. It was just really an amazing moment of either amnesia or um, inattention. So they seem to me weirdly unacquainted with the long, um, tough, highly charged relationship between Westerners and the federal government, but I found that they were receptive, that scientists and engineers in that case and in others, once they had a glimpse, once they could see how their historical amnesia had made their own lives that so much harder to go into Leadville surprised that they were not uh, welcomed. So, that's one example of the cheer that we'll come back to, but now we're going to do the Jeremiah part. For the big framework of this talk, and for the big framework of this profession, and our lives in this profession, and maybe especially our protégés and apprentices and uh, the incoming group, I'm going to go back to a speech that Ken Jackson gave in 2001 when he was president of this association. And I will just say, note that day, 2000, 2001. Uh, we will call this, I guess, and I have corresponded a little bit with Ken about this, and he's fine with my hiding behind him. Uh, I didn't really tell him I was doing that. But this is called our Jacksonian Jeremiah. And <laughs> it takes, I uh, remember, the, uh, remember but, uh, would you, but the uh, conference title for his conference was called Connections, Rethinking Our Audiences, 14 years ago. Okay, so here I'm just going to give you a few quotable passages from Ken's presidential speech, which was called The Power of History, Poland, The Weakness of a Profession. This is a really blunt speech. Okay. I'm such a mind person, really. It's a little bit, okay, but here we go. Channel and Ken. But there is no way to dodge the fact that history is flunky as a profession. That historians are marginalized by the larger society and that most Americans would neither know, know nor care if the profession we love simply disappeared. I, I did ask him what the reaction was, and he said, well, quiet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are developing a class or caste system within our institutions. At the top are the few stars who have secure positions, generous salaries, numerous ways to make money on the side, and a steady stream of graduate students. In the middle are tenured teachers who have security but few prospects for outside offers or internal advancement. And at the bottom of the occupational structure is the historical profession's version of migratory farm workers or temps, instructors who are at the mercy of enrollment patterns and sudden changes in the economic climate. <coughs> Following up on that description, typically we blame college administrators for this situation, but we make up the search committees that promotion committees, the tenure committees, the graduate admissions committees. And we run associations such as the OEH, which as you may have noticed, this is Ken, awarded 20 times as many prizes for scholarship this evening as it did for teaching. A few more quotations. We should tear down the barriers that currently divide college professors from classroom teachers and university professors from community college professors. We need to give more attention to clear writing and a vivid prose style. Young scholars often think that they have to be opaque in order to be thought intelligent and thoughtful. They do not realize that dull and difficult writing often conceals shoddy and careless thinking. Too many history monographs are dragged down by convoluted sentences, confusing paragraphs, weak transitions, and impenetrable conclusions. No wonder the general public regards academic writing as lousy writing. And then, uh, Quotation. We need to reconnect with the broad general audience out there in the real world. The lawyers, physicians, politicians, administrators, reporters, plumbers, and business people who really wanted to be historians but feared they could not get jobs and so followed another fork in the road. They are hungry for what we say and what we write. So that is the speech, or that's not the whole thing. So 
He pointed quotations from the speech Ken Jackson gave 14 years ago. I think I didn't really ask huh, this misery of human subjects when you correspond with a friend. Should you go to your university and ask for a human subjects forum? And then before you go, well, Ken Jackson has not received his human subjects forum, but he did feel that not that much has changed since he gave that speech, and many things may have gotten, gotten worse. So, I bet you're in the mood now for the promised shift to the utopian visions and celebration of possibility. <laughs> so, what we're going to do now is um, agree. That'll be fun. We'll test that to see if that happens. Whatever divides the members of the early age, the, surely the one quality that unites us is that we are not fans of amnesia. And we recognize that just like an individual afflicted with amnesia, a society afflicted with amnesia has a big problem, a problem that will man manifest itself in millions of symptoms in that society. The members of the OAH, I would say further, are professionally the best positioned people in the country to offer the treatment program for societal amnesia. Indeed, everyone in this room is already hard at work in this mission of rescuing society from amnesia. Are we already doing it well? Yes. Could we do it better? Yes. And could we do it better if we had more of a sense of chosen, thought through, dynamic, consensual collaboration in a common cause? Yes, the answer to that was yes, in case you were wondering there. Uh, so now we're just going to do a little poll here. Uh, am I right in saying that there's not a single fan of amnesia in the room? Uh, that's what I thought. Uh, that would be so embarrassing for one person to say, I don't know, I kind of like an adult society that doesn't know much about its past. Um, that person has had a hard semester, but we'll listen to that. That person says, <laughs> says that. Um, and are we agreed that we might, I'll go with might, might be the best position people country to move this along, take on the stream of program. You haven't heard the inspiration of Marx yet, so <laughs> inspirational speech just going to go this Okay, um, so the question before us are what are the most effective methods for treating this amnesia? And there is literal, well there's a there's very significant disagreement on the best methods, and that's fine, and that's good, and I will say to leap ahead, I should push for one method, but in no way am I putting that method above others. I'm just saying, let's add this one, and maybe not add this one, but let's make more of this one than we, than we have. So, um, not to give this whole matter of crass and mercenary tinge, but we have to ask another question. Could these treatment programs for societal amnesia be configured and reconfigured in a way that would direct the flow of more money to the history profession? and provide more jobs for young people getting degrees, both undergraduate and advanced degrees in history. And I think, this is not inspirational speaking, this is really to the core of my soul, I think the answer to that is yes. Okay, now we get to the peculiar title of my talk, Historians as Public Intellectuals, a Cost-Benefit Analysis Seen from the Interior. What could that last part mean? The use of the word interior was a tricky way of leaving myself options for the speech, options of plenty. I could mean, and certainly did mean, to a large degree, interior, the public intellectual's life from, seen from inside the mind and soul of a historian who has gone all out on public engagement. I could mean that. But I could also mean a historian, or the point of view of a historian who lives in the deep interior of North America, where I do live. For 30 years, I have not been the least bit close <laughs> visit, and then, actually I am in the waves, I'll take the waves, but ocean, you can have the ocean, I will take the interior. And then, it could also be about the interior of the earth, because I've been doing for three, three years or so a very big project trying to place unconventional shale, oil, and gas development and hydraulic fracturing into a historical context. So we could actually do the subsurface and the interior of the earth. And, we could also do, here is a fact that just has to be lived with, um, I've been preoccupied for decades with the Department of the Interior. <laughs> Wasn't that tricky? That was pretty clever for that. And I think I know which preferred topics are here to touch with. If I said, okay, some geology, let's do subsurface and um, fracture heights and fracking fluid and so on, I could do that. but. People have been very kind to me, so <laughs> I'm going to spare you that. Um, I will speak a little bit about the Department of the Interior. 
they are tricky terms. A person who was very badly tricked by the term was the, what is she, a starling, or what the terms are, media figure, Jessica Simpson, who visited the White House when Gail Norton was the first female Secretary of the Interior. And Jessica Simpson came in and was shown around, and she was introduced to the Secretary of the Interior. And Jessica Simpson said to the Secretary of the Interior, I love what you've done with these interiors. <laughs> <laughs> but my guess is, this is right in terms of where we'll spend the bulk of our time, my guess is that if you came to the session for some reason, other than dreary duty and obligation to be kind to the great evidence for you, you were expecting, the, probably expecting the emphasis of the talk to be on the first part of the title, the interior, the first possible meaning of interior, the interior workings and strategies of historians as public intellectuals in the context of our kind of stressed, and changing profession, and indeed that will be the focus. Because the president usually does speak about his or her scholarly and writing interests, we will take 2.4 minutes on the Department of the Interior and why I have become such a fan of um, that subject. Usually people approaching me, uh, public, public members or citizens, general citizens or historians, usually they come up to, when they come up to me and say, well, what are you working on these days? I either hoping it, they assume it will be some interesting Western American topic. And when I say, I'm working on bureaucracy and infrastructure, there's a deep sense of terror at that moment. And I'm like, oh, I see my old friend. I must go talk to that, that friend. Um, but in my opinion, interior is well worth working on because Interior, studying the Department of Interior with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the land office, and so on, um, gives us an extraordinary opportunity to face up to the big paradox in American history, one of many big paradoxes, that the colonies had barely completed their rebellion against empire when the new nation acquired its own empire, and the Department of the Interior, formed in 1849, was the locus and center point of the project of asserting control over conquered lands and conquered people. So, Department of the Interior, I think, is just the best way to get at that interesting paradox. I think it is also a great chance to think intensely about the history of corruption and other forms of bad behavior in government as we confront a populace that is so susceptible to anti-government feelings. Where might that have come from? Well, the project of uh, writing about the Department of the Interior also reminds us that the word public servant and the word bureaucrat are kind of synonyms with very different affect and very different association. And at some point, we have to work that out. We have to return to why we have governmental agencies at the federal, state, and local level, and why, in fact, the heritage of corruption in an agency or in a department like Interior can't poison our thinking. It does no justice to us today. It does no justice to the public servants who are working hard. The, uh, the woman from the Underground Railroad, from the National Park Service, she is not, there's no reason to implicate her in that uh, sad history of the department of the 19th century. So those are my reasons for working on the Department of the Interior. And that was 2.4 minutes on, a little less than that, on the president's work. And now we're going to go on to the sheer uh, and utopian visions of the professions opportunities. I'm going to start with a few premises for my thinking, and they will become less appealing as we go through the first one or two. We bought, well, the first one we already did, the first premise that's already mentioned, is that in our various ambitions, in our range of professional self-definition, de which there are many, we all want to provide a treatment program for a society with a chronic susceptibility to amnesia. Vote yes. Members of the OH, again, are already, this is the really excellent news I'll be able to give in a little bit more detail in a moment, are already administering that treatment program to great effect. But there are arenas and opportunities and lines of action still open for more attention and more action. My second central premise is that historians have a domain of tremendous, dramatically underutilized social, cultural, maybe even political power but particularly a domain where should they move in there with greater numbers, it's not a domain we have not occupied at all, but should we move out there with more uh, purposeful plans and coordinated actions, our chances to improve the quality and productivity of public converse, conversation could really escalate. And again, I will add that it could also 
lead to a stream of jobs, employment, funding to the historical profession, especially to young folks. Now, what I'm going to propose in a moment or two is not in any way to cut back on the role of historians as advocates of causes. That should go on, and I would in no way interrupt that, but I'd like to add a few variations that might seem different from that, but I think would be in their own way more effective. Premise number two continued, basically, to spell out premise number two. It is my conviction that there is already enough polarization in society today, and I do not need to contribute to such an overstaffed project. Not even working on that, and I don't know what I could do if I wanted to add to it, but this is already out there. The practitioners in the field of history are wonderfully, spectacularly positioned to invite the public out of that polarization and into a more productive form of conversation, discussion, and deliberation. Premise number three, here's the domain that I am uh, speaking of. Historians can enhance their power and influence through conspicuous performances of neutrality. Though I will act quickly, with that position of neutrality functioning as a step or a phase, not as a final destination. To restate this premise, as I really put it more as a hypothesis, compared to conventional advocacy, neutrality can sometimes work much more effectively to enhance the cultural, political, intellectual, social power and influence of historians as public intellectuals. Premise number four, probably my favorite. With rare exceptions, humor is essential for the, for the successful, sustained work of a public intellectual. That means partly that yes, there is a lot more to do with humor in public communication. Our visitor, Bob Mankoff, said that there's studies plenty that show that attention and memory pick up when humor is in play. And if there's a classroom teacher in this room who doesn't know that through and through, that they're going into stupors, they're slouching, bring them back. Uh, we certainly have all tested that a thousand times. But probably more important for the public intellectual enterprise, humor is essential for the mental health, the, the inner world, the interior of the historian operating as a public intellectual. Don't try this without the chance to retreat and have a good laugh over misadventures that might have occurred. I will give two examples on fracking. Fracking is intensely polarized in my part of the country, really polarized. These two limericks, limericks are universally loved by everybody in every imaginable position on the subject. Every, every audience across the spectrum of opinion responds very favorably to this. The first one is my autobiographical one. When you claim to be neutral on fracking, you're a quarterback set up for sacking. You can assert and declare that you're going to be fair, but you still won't escape frequent whacking. <laughs> and then, uh, this one is usually loved as well. Knowledge is tragically lacking on the complicated subject of fracking. Convinced they are right, people rush into fight, and no agency regulates yak. <laughs> So, I mean, I have field tested that with every magical group, and everyone responds to the limit. What happens after the limit, we don't <laughs> they go back to their camps, but there's a moment of promise there. And after last, um, last evening, I would like to add premise number five, which I'm taking from our panelist last, uh, last evening, Johan Neem, Western Washington State. I'm adding a fifth one, that we would do better. He spoke so wonderfully on this, I think some of you may have heard him last night, that we would do better as a association at the, of the OAH if we cut back on talking about history professors and shifted to talking about historians. So that we would observe, but then instantly transcend the familiar categories, public historian, academic historian, K through 12, community college, four-year college, research university, teacher. For instance, a key point that sort of came out in our panel, we have uh, last night, we have every good reason to tighten the ties and enliven the conversation between academic historians and public historians, to compare, compare notes, to swap strategies, and to avoid reinventing the wheel through that. So that is the Johann Neem proposition of not so much about professors and a lot more about historians. And um, we have to make this is my final overarching, summing them all up, uh, not a numbered premise, just pulled them all together. 
we have a much wider field of possibility in this vast domain of relieving and remedying society's amnesia than we can notice when we are racing, ar racing around with our daily tasks and obligations bearing down on us. Acting on this possibility could measurably address and deal with our most troubling professional dilemmas. So, here is really good news. Hundreds of OAH members have already validated all of those premises. You could clap for yourself now if you would like. <laughs> and that could be a subjective, um, impressionistic, anecdotal remark, except I do have documentary evidence. In May of 2014, I wrote a column as president, and I asked people who are working, uh, who are our university or college or community college based, um, what they were doing outside their universities or colleges, community colleges, and um, how I could, well, I, I was responding to that Nicholas Kristof column in the New York Times saying that we were an isolated group of humanists. So I got, and sadly my life has been out of control, so I didn't get around to reading these until last week, but thank you everyone who wrote. It is that I did not have time really to ask for permission to quote you, so. I'm not doing that now, but man, have I got a wonderful stat of probably about 140 responses from people. There are, there's an astounding number of our people giving public lectures to every imaginable venue. There's an amazing number of people working with K-12 teachers. There's all sorts of volunteering um, as advisors in, in local museums. It is really great. And one, I would have liked to have read a person who did some research that got formal apologies to a couple of people who had been really terribly treated in the mid 20th century and apologies from different legislative bodies and so on. So just astoundingly moving tales. Um, and that's, that's just a sampling of the, of the category. So I will write these people and ask for permission to quote so that when this thing appears in print, I will be able to give proper tributes to those, to those folks. But it was, uh, really striking to see how many activities were already underway. I yearn, and maybe as a past president, I might be able to figure out some way with working with Kathy where we can really inventory that. Because there's no place where you can go. I mean, Nicholas Kristoff couldn't find, had he looked, um, not clearly he looked, but had he looked, he would not have been able to find that kind of pooling of these efforts. But it is really an impressive story. And I hope anybody who did not write me uh, and who heard that writing me didn't any good and you never got a response from me, <laughs> but uh, I am totally attuned to this now, so please think about, about writing me those stories. And I will now, though, turn to some stories from my own experience, but it seemed like the best way to go to, if I wanted to go quickly beyond Jeremiah and to assert this possibility. I have reasons for taking myself as a specimen of the historian as public intellectual, one again, is that I did not think ahead to write and get permission to quote from the member responses, so I'll do that later. Uh, the second reason is that I can speak critically and even harshly about this particular specimen in a way that would be injurious or hurtful if I appraised another person in that fashion. And the third one is that I have pretty good, if not perfect, access to the inner world, the interior of the specimen. <laughs> and I do not have to fill out a human subjects research form to interrogate this particular specimen. Oh. And let me just be really clear about saying that this next few minutes is not premised in any, on any claim to have figured out public intellectual life. It is endless learning. So, starting off with myself as a specimen, and I do want to say that this is inspired a little bit by a moment when I was in graduate school. I had a class with C. Van Woodward, and half of the books were, top, were, were written by C. Van Woodward. So we stumbled badly over how to refer. Did the author... <coughs> <laughs> so, at one point, Mr. Woodward, watching us struggle, said, we shall proceed as though the author were not present. <laughs> well, if you would step out, Professor Woodward, we could do that. <laughs> Here and then, when we talked about um, Tom, his Tom Watson book, which had been published, I guess, probably 30 years before that, a little more than 30 years, he said, he said, you know, I really hardly feel as if I were the author of that book. And I'm 22 years older, and I think, oh, poor Mr. Woodward, it says his name on the cover. And <laughs> I'm not just that anymore. And so I certainly understand what happened 
there. And the author of The Legacy of Conquest is sort of here and sort of not here in that same, <laughs> in that same vein. But I'm going to do just a tiny bit of reminiscing about phase one of the intellectual and phase two of the intellectual as the specimen has experienced it. The days of your were exhilarating. Legacy of Conquest came out in 1987, and quite an uproar occurred. I do like argument, I do like debate. I was pretty thin-skinned, but I really couldn't afford that very long. Um, so it was quite a wild time. One interesting older professor wrote an article saying that the new Western history was uh, had three well, negative associations. He said that the I think I was probably the principal one referred to that the new Western history was at once Stalinist, deconstructionist, and fascist. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you think that was easy to do, that was easy to do. That required really checking your watch every few weeks to see which ones you're reading now. Uh, one historian wrote an article called The New Western History. Much of that article focused on me, the newest horror on the block. So that was quite a time. Um, and then it moved on surprisingly fast. It did seem to me I went from being a quite wild young Turk to being a subtle old bird within I mean, graduates who have to read the Legacy of Conquest for the qualifying exams. That's ready for a museum at that point. That's a uh, <laughs> tough moment. So, so the transition we are about to explore is how did the new Western history feisty Patty Lemmerich become the current Patty Lemmerich? Because I sometimes say I was once controversial and contentious, and then I became collaborative and congenial. <laughs> and to many people, that has been a bitter disappointment to watch. <laughs> Maybe a little bit me as well. So, and yet from the beginning, when Legacy Conquest came out, the dream in that book, and it's pretty clearly stated, was to bring historical perspective to bear on current dilemmas. The slogan of our Senate American West uh, has been for a while turning hindsight into foresight with the growing recognition that that is not a walk in the park. So uh, my early adventures, after Legacy came out, after the Senate American West was founded about the same time, those made sense to me. Those were exactly what I thought I would be doing with the harvest from Legacy of Conquest. I was asked, I barely moved to Boulder, I was asked to write um, an essay for the Native American Rights Fund on the suppression of Indian religious freedom. And I wrote that essay and it went to every member of Congress because they were considering an Indian religious freedom uh, affirmation. And so that was exactly what I wanted. I wrote, at the same time, I wrote a uh, report on a building on my campus, Nichols Hall, which had been named for a participant, a captain, who uh, led his civilian well, his militia, his militia troops at the Sand Creek Massacre. David Nichols was a building, uh, Nichols Hall was a building on campus. I wrote the report that got that name changed to Cheyenne Rappaport Hall. So, life is consistent. The Legacy of Conquest author is out there doing the kind of thing she wants to do. There was also a proliferation of remarkable and unexpected speaking opportunities in the late 1980s. I got to speak to the National Association of Latino and Latina elected officials. I got to speak to the Council of Energy Resource Tribes. It was really an astounding set of experiences. A number of the federal agencies, the leadership of the federal agencies, asked me to speak to the uh, Bureau of Land Management leadership and so on, environmental groups, Greater Yellowstone Coalition, giving plenary addresses. It was consistent and it was great and it was getting scary because the trust that seemed to radiate at in those situations. We have a historian, she'll help us. Was, I didn't expect that much uh, goodwill and attentiveness from people who were in very applied situations, who were really on the front lines of issues. So, why not continue in that mode of the same assertiveness, the same outspokenness, the same embrace of causes one reason, and this was totally unexpected to me, um, was getting just on the edge of boredom, hearing myself speak. I've said that before, but in a different <laughs> venue, I think so. So I would pitch in and do it again. But I was also in spending too much of my time, I felt, in the company of the light like-minded, that was very pleasant, dinner parties where I would be about to say something, two other people would say it before I could say it. 
Well, those are very smart people, but I was going to say that. So, uh, boredom, which again, I did not see coming, but then felt I had to adapt to, to the point that I began to really say to myself, what would happen if I experimented with a proposition that a stance of neutrality could increase my audience and enhance my influence and add to the interest of my life and provide me with an abundance of stories, case studies, anecdotes, and parables. So that is what I've been doing. Now the word neutrality is a troubled and troublesome term. Uh, my apologies to Peter Novak and any others who have written on the subject, but it is, seems to be necessary to admit. I am more interested in what happens when a historian takes neutrality and objectivity as a form of publicly performed conduct and not necessarily what happens when historians arrive at a well-worked out theoretical understanding of neutrality. What it means as a form of, well, I mean, it is just an endless life burden that the phrase fair and balanced took such a terrible turn in its <laughs> dramatic life. Um, but what I wanted to try to do was to see if I could use the performance of neutrality as an occasion for convening people who were in fractured and fragmented circumstances to act as a kind of referee or umpire, certainly an understaffed role in public life. What has that got to do with a profession of history? Why wouldn't I go back to mediation school or facilitation school? Because, in fact, being a historian has value that I don't think you facilitators and moderators who don't have that card to play can, um, can operate. That's to say that giving people a longer context in time is almost in itself the delivery system for clearing the mind, or at least clearing the mind of the noise of the moment. It certainly addresses the amnesia issues, and it also says, I think, think back in time, you might be able to think longer into the future. So that was the trick. But it's also, this, this has to be said, it's just a wonderfully disorienting moment. If you bring in, you have a contentious group of people, they're fighting about different issues, the speaker comes in and then starts talking about something that happened 150 years ago. There's probably a moment of despair in the room of, why is she doing that? But in fact, it is disorienting and it does make people listen and they cannot instantly leap to their pre-existing position because they have no idea what is going on there. So that seems to be a workable approach. Plus, what we're doing, I don't think it's called really facilitation or anything like it. It is doing what we did in college and graduate classes ourselves and what we do with our, our classes, which is to pay attention to primary sources and first-person testimony, consider groups that occupy a range of positions, and then work your way toward a summation and judgment that you can support with evidence. And in my case, some of the sources are written and recorded, and some of the uh, participants are no longer with us, but some of them are right in front of me. So, neutrality is a publicly performed, repeatedly proclaimed stance that you maintain, putting aside, genuinely putting aside your preconceptions, while you take in information and ask questions and read and listen, and then as you begin to weigh what you have learned, that's where the neutrality phase starts to fade and the coming out with conclusions uh, comes in. Publicly performing the phase of neutral inquiry, though, gives you dramatically better positioning and significantly increased credibility when you shift out of neutrality and put forward your conclusions, shift out of neutral and put forward your findings, then, to put it bluntly, it is much harder for your critics to brush you off or to dismiss your findings if you have invested time and trouble in this public performance of neutrality. So uh, that happens to be a practice that, is, that gets harder the more you, the more you uh, practice it, but then that's, that's acceptable, uh, very stimulating undertaking. So I'm now going to give you some stories of what this means in lived reality. I brought the former secretaries of the interior sequentially. I always have to say the living former secretaries as if I could have brought the girl ladies or something. <laughs> so Scheduling is very difficult. Um, so I brought the former secretaries of the interior because I am fascinated by the department and I did do some important recordings. I interviewed each secretary in a private interview, a four or five hour interview. I was very well prepared for it. And then I did a public interview with a big public audience um, with them. The secretary series was very interesting. I had almost all of them. Started with Stuart Udall, who 
done through. And at some point early in the process, I had to think to myself, well, I have to invite them all. They cannot be the secretaries who are my particular cup of tea when it comes to policy. I must invite them all. And if you're, you know what that means, that meant that I had to persuade James Watt to come to Boulder. Because it couldn't be Patty Limerick's politically favored secretaries of the interior. And that, so, so I it took, I think, 12 half hour phone calls to persuade Jim Watt to come to Boulder. But he did come. And he had a fine time. And he liked it so much he came back and um, came with Stuart Udall. The two of them engaged in a conversation, which was an interesting experience. Right after Jim Watt's visit to Boulder, a friend who drives a pickup truck, lives in Boulder, he was heading north out of, out of um, towards Wyoming, and his pickup truck gave him cover. So he stopped at a gas station pretty close to Wyoming, and a car pulled up with Wyoming, Universe Wyoming um, stickers on it. And so my friend said, they started chatting at the gas station, they started chatting with the driver of this car, and they talked about various problems at the University of Colorado. And then my friend said, you know, some interesting things have been happening there. Why, your fellow Wyoming, he got that far, and the man said, oh yeah, we've all heard that in Wyoming. This is my state. We heard that Jim Watt came to Boulder and had a great time. He said, what we heard is there's some woman there who's seen the light. <laughs> <laughs> That's not quite accurate, but, but uh, there's, so there is a spin control problem with me trying, um, which is that it spins you around um, before you can set your own terms on it. But then there was also a very poignant moment that just sums up my interesting transformation, I think. I was on the American Historical Association nominating committee, and they were wonderful professors. I liked them very much. And we were, um, we had all voted the same way, and we were concerned about the same <coughs> next electoral issues and so on. So we would, so I was kind of keeping my cover. I didn't want to say anything. So I'm sitting in the American Historical Association nominating committee, my cell phone rings, I look at the number and I realize Jim Watt is calling me while I sit with my seven professorial colleagues. I'm not going to tell them, I just <laughs> step out of the room. So that was my double life for a while. Um, I'm going to give you one other example of these interventions. I had a remarkable man, John Whitaker, was Nixon's environmental policy advisor and then he went over to Interior and became the Deputy Secretary of Interior. His Secretary uh, had passed away with Rogers Morton, so I brought John Whitaker. He's a remarkable man. He's a very striking person who really, that puzzle, how was Nixon the environmental president? Why, well, John Whitaker is the answer to a lot of that. He's a volunteer, he's a head of a uh, nonprofit for a long time that helps old people restore their homes so they can continue to live there. It's a really good school. So I ended up being quite fond of John Whitaker, and he told me that his backup on environmental issues, when he was in a pinch and he needed to persuade the president, the person he could always turn to was John Ehrlichman. Oh, no. Oh, no. Um, so that's hard. But then I am persuaded by what I have heard about John Ehrlichman's importance. So I have a slideshow, I'm doing a PowerPoint. I'm describing the Nixon presidency and the interior during the Nixon presidency, and I, I'm going to have to speak about John Ehrlichman and explain how much he did on behalf of environmental laws that really had quite a transformative effect on the country. And so I, next slide, John Ehrlichman comes up, and it's Boulder, Colorado, and about, I don't know what, 10 people hiss. And I've got John Whitaker here, who, who does not in any way deny the wrongdoing of the Nixon, Nixon administration, but who found things to value in them. So I'm just trying to be a good hostess. So I tell him to stop hissing, the temperature in the room drops 50 degrees with liberal rage and hostility that I kept them from hissing. I have to go forward and speak favorably about John, well, just speak factually, I guess, about John Ehrlichman's commitment to environmental issues. So that happens. Then I write a column a week later about the discomfort that comes from when your father's main characteristic in life was that my father hated Richard Nixon. And now I'm up there asking people not to hiss at John Ehrlich, and if I were my father's daughter, I would lead to hissing him, be honest. <laughs> so that was a very uncomfortable situation, but I wrote a column about that discomfort. I sent it to John Whitaker. He then wrote me, um, well, excuse me, I, I, it was, the column appeared. People wrote me from around the country. 
some people on Whidbey Island in Washington wrote me, and they said that they felt that John Ehrlichman had saved them from a, a very bad chemical plant that was going to be placed there. He was a young environmental attorney, and he it's actually before the term environmental attorney would have existed, but he came in and represented Whidbey Island and kept a major chemical plant from going in there. So I took that letter, the testimony from Whidbey Island, the people who were still so grateful to John Ehrlichman for saving that, I packed it up and I sent it with my column to John Whitaker. Then I get a letter back from John Whitaker, who writes me to say that he values that so much, he had packed it all up and sent it to the director of the Nixon Library. And my column and <laughs> is now in the Nixon Library. <laughs> That's not what I want to be. So there was, um, um, and I, I will just uh, give one more story in this order, and I know I'm preaching a Indian point here pretty soon. But I had Gail Norton, the uh, first female secretary, and she was still in office, and so we were concerned about protesters. And uh, four, three or four young people brought in a banner about the Cobell case, the issue of the uh, bad handling and interior of entities, which Gail Norton inherited and certainly did not originate in the late 19th century. Anyway, those young folks stood up and unfurled the banner and started shouting. I had said to Secretary Norton that I would go down to the audience and offer to take any protesters to lunch and find out what their concerns were and to pass them on to her, so I went out of the audience. Bewildering things start happening. I'm going to quiet the protesters. The protesters get louder. What could be going on? I say to them, I will take you to lunch tomorrow anytime you want. I will take any concerns. I will write them up forcefully. I will send them to the secretary. But people, 700 people came to hear the secretary. I'm asking you to sit down. So, when we're not they leave, I go back up on the stage. I think, why did they get louder? And then I notice I'm wearing a lavalier mic. <laughs> so, in my effort to quiet the protesters, I have given them our speech. I tell that story because that is one of the outcomes and consequences of the performance of neutrality. I can give people who would not get a hearing a better hearing because I have taken the stance of neutrality. So, my amplifying the protesters, it's a paradox, it certainly wasn't my intention, but I certainly have been able to give uh, various people who might have been ill position to express themselves, which has to be heard. So there we are. Those are um, the two phases. I believe that phase one was not so good for learning. Phase one, it wasn't enough variation. It was too much me saying the same stuff and thinking the same stuff. Phase two has had tremendously more possibilities for learning. Uh, and I believe it has given me more and broader credibility that I can speak effectively and persuasively to groups that would have had nothing to do with me in my previous mode. Um, I have endless opportunities to serve as moderator and convener and to continue that, that learning process. The new Western history advocate seems to have, certainly outspoken and forceful, quite an interesting word, but she thought that the miserable state of public understanding of history required her to take the stance, this has got to change. And I will put everything I have into changing that forcefully. The phase two individual, the interpreter, translator, message carrier, moderator, performer of neutrality. My stance now is much more that the miserable state of public understanding of history has to be dealt with strategically and with careful forethought, though yes, it would be nice if I could force it to change. I don't seem to have that power. So those are the, this is the delightful moment of having contraction joints on the top. We are now going to the conclusion. People love this. My papers move over to the side. People are very happy because they can see the reception ahead of them. So I shall now um, just make one last remark about professional performance and then conclude. For this set of opportunities, and I should say there's a lot of funding in the stories that I could be telling here, senior professors have to change some of their customs. They have to take on causes, um, take, up, excuse me, take up subjects that bring the funding, that support the graduate students, that create positions for people working in that 
that job. It's very different from pursuing an individual research agenda. And yet, if the full professors don't do it, it's hard to know how that institutional shift is going to occur. There are real satisfactions. The students get to see me struggling, flummoxed, thinking. They get to counsel and coach me on what happened there and what am I going to do next. It is such a form of education of options. So I'm saying we need, yes indeed, thousands of people said this, we need a different training of graduate students. And what I would say the difference in training is that we should assume and we should assure them that if they play this out, they will have ideas, findings, illuminations, understandings that people will want to hear. And they will have to be prepared to take that to the people, people who hear it. So it is not a matter of um, the inward looking thing, it's the exhilaration of having ideas that people in the world care about and to make communicating those ideas to the wider world um, part of the training program. And to do it in a state of merriment and joy, not Jeremiah and lamentation. So in the spirit of mer merriment and joy, I'm going to conclude with two approaches and we'll see which one is more effective. One of them does not use humor particularly, but uses life and death, and the other one goes with humor. The first one is that I do have a great life, and on Monday night, back in Boulder, Colorado, I'm giving the uh, Santa Fe West Wallace Stegner Award to our local search and rescue team, mountain search and rescue team, and they are one of the earliest of those groups in the nation. So they're very historic, and they are still a vital group. And I'm very moved to have the chance to interview these people because these are people that when their pagers go off, life comes to a focus. Our human being is in distress and they are moving. And they are not, they're, they're pretty tough, but they are not uh, reluctant to say how terrible a failed effort, how intensely they feel a death that they would have wanted to prevent. So I will be interviewing them on Monday night. And with that on my mind, I think that might be the way to think about our dilemmas. How do we rescue ourselves, our profession, the young people that we have pulled into our world? How do we rescue them from its current, uh, from the profession's current sort of calamitous state? How do we rescue public life and a polarized conversation from its current calamitous state. Our pagers are going off. And many people, as I got from my testimony in response to my college, my column, my column showed me in those responses that many people are responding to those pagers. Human beings in distress, profession in distress, society in distress, many people are responding. But the search and rescue team coordinates. The search and rescue team moves as a group. They know what they're doing. They send people on different details, they compare notes, they're talking all the time about what they're doing and how they'll be ready for the next challenge. So that's the serious life and death comparison. Ken Jackson's pager really went off, and Ken Jackson really put what he had into that, uh, but hundreds of others are responding to those messages of distress. They are not yet in alliance with each other and in collaboration with each other in a way that they could be. And that's okay, then we get that conclusion that is resting on humor. And here's the story that our public publishers were telling me how much they love the story. This appears in the essay Dancing with Professors. I used it a fair number of times and then I thought I'd better retire it. It's been retired for maybe 10 or 15 years, but it is a story that makes the point so excellently about how we can change our practices. We are not trapped. The last people in the world who should be fatalistic and resigned are historians because they know about contingency. They know about choice and will and individuals who made, it, made a difference and groups who came together and strong individuals coming together as groups. And so many of the book prizes were going to people who had written it about that. That's our, that's our holding the knowledge of contingency and the knowledge of what people can do when they put their minds to it. So this story is a uh, way of getting at that point. So I was um, written back in the old days with fighting over Western history. Larry McMurtry wrote quite a bitter attack on the new Western history, and he was quite harsh in his comments about me. So I, um, although 
I actually got to review one of his new books that very same week. And so, <laughs> but what was, uh, uh, this turned out to be true. He said that he did not think much of what I asserted, but he felt that I wrote well. And I said that I did not think much of his plot or character, but I felt that he wrote well. And everyone agreed that, that meant we would probably be friends because we had said those nice things about each other, and we did end up becoming sort of friends. So the story, so several people said, you should read some of Larry McMurtry's work because the early stuff before Lots of Dumb, so I was very sharp, realistic, let's deal with the West that we actually live in stuff. So I was reading some of his earlier essays and I was on a bus going to Denver, older Denver bus, and I hit this story um, about the filming of his, the first time that one of his movies was filmed, or excuse me, one of his uh, books was filmed into a movie. So this is the story about how he went to where uh, his book, Horseman Passed By, was being made into the movie HUD. And he got there about a week after the filming started. He was very excited, first time he'd ever had a book made into a film. So he said to people, how's it all going? And they looked, all the filmmakers, everybody on the crew, everyone just looked kind of stricken. And they would speak um, in halting terms, frightened terms about the buzz of the scene. And no one wanted to talk about the buzzard scene. So it was several more days before Larry Burge got the story of the buzzard scene and how it had broken people's spirits. So what had happened is that there was a city where Paul Newman is supposed to, the ranch is failing, they're having terrible times. Paul Newman comes riding up on his horse and he sees a dead heifer. And this ranch cannot afford to lose another animal. So he's distraught, he takes out his gun, and he there's Buzzards waiting to get at that dead heifer, and they're lined up on a dead tree branch. And he is to take his gun out and fire in their direction, and they are to lift off and disappear into the blue pen handle sky. So that's what the scene was supposed to be. And the complexity came for what it took to get that scene filmed. The first problem was that where they were filming the panhandle, they had pretty bad looking buzzards. <laughs> so they thought they could put out a casting call, basically, so dead meat, and then where they come. And they came, but they didn't look good. Uh, they were not robust. And so, so then uh, everybody had to wait for a day or two while they went and got better looking buzzers. <laughs> I can't remember where they got that. I used to try to put that in the story in case you were overlooking, but you'll have to get back to me if you want to know where to get the buzzers. So, so then um, they brought the buzzers. So that's good. Now we have buzzers. We've got a dead tree branch. Seems like things are going to work. But then there's a real technical problem here. How do you keep the buzzards <laughs> sitting on the branch until their cue comes for them to fly? <laughs> so someone was clever and thought, I've got it. We'll wire their feet to the branch <laughs> and we'll put a sort of um, parallel to the branch wire running through the loops that pull them so that we can pull that wire and then their feet will all be released simultaneously and then they can fly. But as Larry Murphy said, they did not reckon with the complexities of buzzard psychology. <laughs> so the buzzards got their feet wired to the branch and they were supposed to just sit there and fall. But no, instead, even though they did not have enough mobility to fly, get off the branch, they had enough mobility to try to fly and to flop forward and to hang upside down in front of the tree branch. And then, if, I don't know if there's any ornithologists or bird watchers here, but bird physiology does not work upside down. <laughs> Why in nature would that be an adaptation? So, so they passed out. <laughs> they flapped for a bit and then they had to be revived. And that's not an easy process in itself to get a painted buzzard back. So, so then it ha so they would get it back on the branch and try it again and they would do the same damn thing of trying to fly, flopping forward, fainting, revived. So finally, the buzzards stayed on the branch. They, but then it turned out that when you pulled the wire, they had learned the lesson. And they had learned, stay where you are. <laughs> we tried that before with us. We tried to fly. It did not work out. We are staying on the branch. And you can fire guns at them, and they just stay on the branch. <laughs> 
rancher. And so then some very high-powered animal trainers had to be brought in to get buzzard self-conscious, or self-confidence, I don't know about self-consciousness, but, that word, but uh, they had to get buzzard self-confidence back up. And days passed, and the crew was costing money, and it just went on and on and on. So when I read that story on the bus, I just thought, this is the parable of all times. We have capacity. So I'll just go for a friendly uh, seems a little rude to say this. But anyway, uh, we go, we have the capacity to fly. We go to graduate school. We have episodes where we flop forward. <laughs> and sometimes we're held back under the branch. But at a certain point, we think, better not to fly. Better not to give that a try. And yet, the wire has been pulled. That's the great thing about getting a PhD. It's certainly a great thing about tenure. The wire is pulled, and you are free to leave the branch. So that is the humorous way of putting my point. Um, and then I'm going to give you a wonderful public intellectual strategy. How do you get out so that you look like you're closing purposely when you meant to? First, you close. You go back to where you were. You go back to Kenneth Jackson. In this case, back to Kenneth Jackson. And I will read my favorite, 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 very positive, very wonderful statement from the Jackson, uh, Ken Jackson's Jeremiah. Our critics say we are strange because we sit in libraries and read about dead people. But you know, it is foolish to limit your acquaintance to those people who by sheer chance happen to be alive in the same place and time as you are. <laughs> that is really good. But then, uh, now, so then you want to say, well, is she finished? Well, she must be finished. This is how you can always look as if you were, this is exactly where I wanted to finish. You tell this anecdote, because um, as a public intellectual, you're always trying to fit more into the uh, available time than you have. So this is how you get off stage. You say, well, this reminds me, the situation right now reminds me of the um, classical Western story about the town, quiet little town, where people were sitting around and a uh, quiet stranger was sitting off in the corner of the saloon and then a horrible, disruptive, really very unpleasant cowboy came into the saloon and he was just, just an extremely disturbing force there and he was knocking people's hats off and, and breaking glasses and knocking bottles over and they, the townspeople, gentle people, and they did not know what to do. But then suddenly, the quiet stranger in the corner of the room got up and walked over very slowly, very purposely, to the wild cowboy. And he said to the cowboy, I'm giving you five minutes to get out of town. And then, to the townspeople's joy, the cowboy just packed up, just, OK, well, I'm going. And he left, and he rode out of town. And the townspeople were very grateful. And they went over to the quiet stranger, and they said, thank you so much. They said, but we're a little bit curious. What would you, what were you going to do? What would you have done if he had not left town? And the quiet stranger said, I believe I would have extended the time. 